He attended Cypress High School in Western Salt Lake County and graduated in 2003. His, um, his undergraduate degree was in urban planning in the uh, geography department, and he got a job as a radio producer and eventually went back to school. He is currently a graduate student studying transportation engineering with Dr. Schultz. And he should graduate in either April or June, and after that he hopes to find his work in uh, with a public agency in Southern California. So please join me in welcoming Rob Sanders. Okay. Well, let's keep, I promise I'll keep this short and painless. How many of you eat at this McDonald's on Freedom Boulevard and uh, oh, Bulldog? Yeah. Is that fun to get in and out of there? Because you have, people can uh, just make a left whenever they feel like it. Right, right by the traffic light, no problem. And if that's not fun enough, watch this uh, Prius over here at Arby's. Going to make a left out and start heading back to campus, right? Go out Bulldog. Oh, no, wait. They're making a ride onto Freedom, which they should have done at the driveway they were supposed to. But this way, they don't have to wait for the light. It's real convenient, right? The reason why that's dangerous is a concept you probably already know. And intuitively, you definitely know is conflict points. You're cruising along. You slow down to make your left turn, and somebody could rear-end you as you slow down. As you're crossing across, somebody could right angle crash you here. Maybe I'm turning out in front of somebody and crash. Anywhere where these two lines cross over, there's a potential for a collision. And so if you want to reduce collisions, you want to reduce conflict points. And access management deals a little bit uh, with trying to reduce that. So let's look at our McDonald's here. You have Bulldog and Freedom. And typ a typical intersection has 32 conflict points. We're counting a little more because I'm counting each lane separate, but the concept is the same. But then you start adding in our McDonald's driveway we were looking at, and that adds many more conflict points, including this straight motion that should not legally be possible, because you in, there's this intersection functional area where the cars wait for the light, they need space to turn left and turn right, and you're cutting out into that space, which hurts the efficiency of the operation of the intersection. That felt, I did that, it felt really scary but apparently it's legal because this guy left me alone. <laughs> okay, so then you add in all the driveways where everybody connects it, and that adds many more conflict points. And then you add all the ways that people can enter in, and pretty soon you have a street that's a mess of conflict points. I don't know about you, but as you leave campus and you drive out to 500 West where Macy's is, that's only a mile and a half. Do you feel tired? By the time you deal with the busy intersections and everybody turning out and turning left in front of you, it's very exhausting. Yet, I bet you could tomorrow night, if you were going out of town, jump on I-15 and drive 300 miles to Nevada and feel reasonably rested by the time you got there, you know, just other than the sitting fatigue, you know. Why is that different? It has to do with reduction of conflict points. The freeway has almost no conflict points. You just have where people merge off and you merge on. It's a road built for mobility. So mobility is we just want to get there without anything in the way. It doesn't matter what land use you're passing by. You restrict it, you put in a wall, a fence, and you just get there. Access would be a street more like Bulldog. Those properties along there want you to turn in and out. Access is important because all of our journeys start somewhere with an access our driveway, you know, our apartment or our house, and we back out, and then maybe ending up at campus in a parking spot or a McDonald's drive through At some point, we want the access. But these two goals of what we're trying to accomplish with a road are kind of con contradictory because you can't have the mobility and the access. And the functional hierarchy of roads, which is a something you may be familiar with. You start in your neighborhood with a lot of driveways and a slow speed, and then as the speed increases on the hierarchy as you work your way up, um, the driveways reduce and reduce until eventually you get out on the freeway where there are no driveways at all, but you're going the fastest speed. And then the idea is you work your way up in the hierarchy, you work your way down. That makes sense on a freeway. You get rid of all the driveways. It makes sense on a local street. You let anybody who wants a driveway put one in. What do you do with all these roads in the middle? That's where access management really starts to get in and shine. 
So I'll talk about it in a minute, but there were a bunch of case studies I looked at that are stored on a website. In one example, there's this road in Arlington, Texas, Cooper Street. It's a lot like um, Bulldog, where there's, businesses have a lot of driveways and a lot of access. But what's worse is you have big neighborhoods over here traveling south to get on the freeway. So it's kind of this mix between University Parkway and Bulldog, and it makes an absolute mess. And Texas DOT wanted to fix that. The crash rate that was a bit too high, and it was just an absolute free-for-all is how they described it in the presentation. So they wanted to play with some access management techniques, reducing driveways, maybe getting businesses to share a driveway, um, putting in a raised median to restrict left turns, as well as looking at the way intersections were designed to protect that intersection functional area and make sure lights weren't spaced too close to each other where the traffic waiting for one light was backing into another. There's a picture that uh, was in the presentation of the free-for-all of people. This person's turning right, this one's waiting to turn left, this guy just turned out left. There's not enough room for him, so he's blocking the lane. Everybody else is backed up waiting for this red signal. It just was it's just not safe. So they installed the raised median and controlled where people could turn left, and as a result, crash rate cut in half. It had a big play. Why that is, if we apply it to our bulldog example, what if we came and put a raised median in there? What does that do to all this conflict? Most of it goes away, more than half of it. There is a one more conflict point of people making a U-turn here, but that little extra bit of conflict is nowhere near what you had before. So that case study was one of many that's right now stored on the Transportation Research Board Access Management's website. Um, they have about 10 years or more of uh, presentations that were presented at conferences where they describe in real life these access management principles that are published in a manual and in other research documents of DOTs actually going out and trying to implement it. And it gets challenging because you have to deal with property owners. Like in this case study, this mobile station has three driveways. You have to work with the owner of the mobile station to change the access. But the problem is it's stored in Adobe Flash, in Adobe Presenter, and Flash and Google don't play nice with each other. So the idea is for outreach purposes, is there a way to teach engineers how to clip just a little tease section of maybe three minutes of the presentation out and post it to YouTube. So we made a Transportation Research Board Access Management YouTube channel. You can go check it out. It actually has some neat things. And um, as people click through and see that, they may, may share it on social media. And uh, oh, and then I created a step-by-step -step procedure where engineers who don't have social media experience, <laughs> right, uh, can get in and uh, learn how to clip a little piece of video and upload it to YouTube. So the idea is you have these presentations that are stored, clip them to YouTube, people share them on social media, some bicycle advocacy or something shares it amongst themselves and goes, hey, that's neat. They click back to the YouTube video. Two or three of those people think, hey, that's really neat. I wish I could see the entire presentation. They can click in the description of the YouTube video back to the original link. So specifically, the case studies I wanted to look at is I wanted to compare some research about access management near freeway ramps, on and off ramps, on the crossroad, the street you exit to, with case studies I saw. The reason why it's important is, um, see there's a problem here. You have the frontage road and there's the red light and you only have about 100 feet and everybody's backing up onto the freeway. And I don't have to tell you why that's a bad thing. You don't want stopped cars on your freeway. So one research document, uh, two engineers in Oregon prepared it back in uh, 2004 called Synthesis 332. It's for the National Cooperative Highway Research Program. And basically what they looked at is on this crossroad near the freeway, what's that safe distance? As you saw, 100 feet is not enough between the first driveway or the first frontage road. What is the, the space safe distance there? How raised medians can help out by reducing a lot of the left turn conflict near the ramps. How frontage roads, when they're designed correctly, help out the interchange. And when they're designed poorly, like that one we saw that was only 100 feet away, it can hurt it and then service roads, which would be tying businesses together with little private roads. 
So one of the first case studies I looked at here was Barnett Road, Medford, Oregon. You have I-5, people come off the ramp here, and they can turn immediately right into this gas station here. And then this gas station also has some driveways too. And there's a problem with that is research in a separate case study and also in NCHRP synthesis, synthesis 332 show that anything, um, any driveway in that first quarter mile has an elevated crash rate but it just gets downright unsafe in the first 300 feet. You really don't want driveways there. And that's a problem here because in the first 300 feet you have restaurants and gas stations and there's no way to provide alternative access if, you, if Oregon DOT were to close these driveways. And you can't just close the driveways. Um, I mean, that, that's common sense, but also the Supreme Court ruled decades ago that you can't eliminate access. You have to provide reasonable access. So you'd have to buy all these businesses up, and what good is that for the community? You lose all their gas stations and their restaurants. Thankfully, uh, uh, some smart engineers had an idea. They said, well, wait a minute. If the problem is either the businesses or the ramps, why don't we just move the ramps? They have the luxury, so it's gone. No more spacing problem. But they had the luxury of they had these fields out here. So they built a brand new interchange. And from day one, they can have a quarter mile right here. This hotel was built later, so they can say, yeah, no access permitted. Same on this side. This gets pretty close to a quarter mile and solve the problem. Up in Anchorage, similar situation. Not quite as many driveways in that first 300 feet, but uh, that first quarter mile, there's quite a few. They don't have the ability to move the interchange because it's in the built-up city. So they got looking at going, well, what if we could just get rid of the lefts? Put that raised median in and reduce the conflict point. But the problem is a lot of these businesses on this side of the street said, now wait a minute, everybody coming off the freeway this way or this way is going to be on this side of the street. They're going to see my gas station and they're not going to want to cross over a raised median or, or make it, well, they can't cross over a raised median, but they, they're making a U-turn. But what if there was a tool that let people make a U-turn as easy as anything else? A roundabout. So you can come up here, cruise along, and go, hey, I want to go to this gas station. So you come up, make your U-turn, flip around, and then you can make a right into the gas station. And that opened up a bunch of case studies, several I looked at, where my gut instinct is a roundabout doesn't work with ramps. You have a high-speed ramp and a slow-speed roundabout. But in certain situations, it works really well because you come out of the roundabout going fairly slow, and so the spacing of the driveway coming out of an intersection, or say the freeway ramp here came off into a roundabout, you could have driveways a bit closer in. Not appropriate everywhere, but in this situation, it worked really well for them. This is not a, a good outcome. This is kind of a sad outcome. They have, in Wichita, Kansas, this major street that goes back and forth. You have a big indoor mall here. You have big box retail. And the street was very busy because you have all the commercial traffic, but you also have people in Wichita trying to get out to the suburbs in the east, Andover, and some of these other communities. And Kansas thought, well, hmm, we have an access need and we have a mobility need. Let's do both. If you've ever been to Texas, they'll put a freeway down the middle and then one-way frontage roads on each side. And then you can put driveways on the frontage roads and then People can just fly down the freeway. And they thought, hey, this is a win-win. This will be great. They spent a whole bunch of money and built it. But the construction took so long. And you notice they had to buy up like all the business on this side of the street <laughs> that uh, the construction impact started pushing people out of business because it was hard to get there. Now, the presenter admits it also didn't help. The construction was going on around the time of the Great, Re great Recession. But by the time he was presenting in 2012, these spaces weren't releasing. People were moving other places, which shows in their access management design, they may be focused on mobility a little too much. Because you have to drive all the way down the one way and make a U-turn and come back. And people, if they're going to go to that much effort, may go, bah, I'll just turn right and go to the other location somewhere else. Well, they're now looking at Andover, that community to the east. And 20 years from now, they predict they're going to have to do the same thing. They got this plan of putting in a freeway and one-way frontage roads. 
But this time, they're looking at going, let's not just look at this corridor. Let's improve the entire network, the grid. You fix up the other streets and make it a nice grid. OK, yeah, it's annoying that I have to, kind of, I have to turn right, and I ultimately want to go this way. But maybe I can just hook back to the neighborhood and do that. And so that may improve some of the access to business. So that stuff, as they're thinking ahead, they don't want to repeat the same mistake. This is my favorite case study. It doesn't directly deal with in the vicinity of freeway interchanges, but the takeaway is important. Well, you know something wrong with that flagpole. <laughs> so consultants would come in to look at access management, corridor analyses, and things for, for this town in, in uh, Connecticut. And the consultants would come back with their report, and they'd say, OK, number one, get rid of that flagpole. That doesn't belong there. Get it out of here. <laughs> but the town, when they'd hear that, they'd take the whole report and just go, yeah, thank you very much, and just never do anything. They'd just rip it up. I mean, everything, even the good things they were recommending of changing access and corridors and things. So this woman, in her case study, worked for a consulting firm that believed in talking to the local community and relying on local context and community input. Turns out, if you survey the community, the very first thing they all say very loudly is, do not remove the flagpole. Even though, from an engineering standpoint, it makes no engineering sense. You, know, you could move it in front of this church, and it would still be there. It turns out, when you get a little bit of local context and talk to people, this flagpole represents a church in 1790 that used to be in the middle of the street. And then later when the church got torn down and replaced, um, there has been a flagpole of, in some form or another since the early 1800s, I think. So to them, saying pull out, or pull out your flagpole is as insulting as if some consultant came in for BYU and said, oh yeah, and by the way, that Y up on the mountain, that's really ugly. You gotta, you gotta take that thing down. I mean, naturally, you'd be outraged because it's sentimental. It's been up there for, you know, decades or, or maybe, I'm not sure how long the why has been up there. But this has been here longer. And so what her point is, is you have to rely on community input and local context. Turns out from local experience, they found people know how to drive around that thing without crashing into it. So the, the, actually, the crash rate really wasn't that bad. And so she says, especially dealing with access management where you're dealing with people's property, you're dealing with businesses in the community that may be sentimental, access management is more an art than a science. It probably would have been more of a science when we first built the interstate system 50 years ago because you were going out to farm fields and you could have bought land and things and it would have been fine. But this is the Hollywood freeway in LA. It's all built up. Of course, it was probably built up when they built the freeway, but Imagine this was out in the country at one point. The Chevron is there. And so the only way you're going to make changes to these interchanges or to access management is when you're retrofitting the interchange. And as a result, you're dealing with adjacent property owners. And you have to be sensitive with the local community to apply it in a local, you know, in a, a solution that uh, fits the context of the local community. Anyway, other takeaways uh, from my research, like I mentioned, the roundabouts are a real surprise. I, I didn't think that that was uh, even something that would work, and it's worked really well in some cases. Don't forget about the pedestrians and bicyclists. The good news is as you change access management and consolidate driveways, that helps pedestrians because they have less conflict as they walk down the street. And as mentioned in the last case study, public coordination is key. By the way, a quick afterthought kind of tying this back to where we started with uh, our McDonald's here. Um, this guy over here did some research with some other graduate students um, a few years ago. And working with some stats, data, and stuff, they found out, I'll be darned, University Avenue and Bulldog has an elevated level of left turn crashes. And I'd, I didn't do the research, but I think it would be safe to assume that this mess of conflict along the whole corridor probably contributes to it in one way or another. And you'd, uh, Provo City listened. Uh, you may be aware of this. They uh, talked about putting in a raised median and consolidating driveways, putting in a nice buffered bicycle lane. Um, I think, personally, this raised median alone is going to make a huge difference. But anyway, I think uh, it looks like next summer they may be working on that. So, Any questions for me? 
You guys are eager to take off. <laughs> is there a, kind of an ideal length of road that should kind of go through this system, go through a reworking? Too short, it's not worth it. Too long, it's too destructive to the, to the surrounding area. You're talking about the length of the corridor? So I, ideally, all roads of the, any length should have their access management reviewed. Whether, and then kind of look at which way are you balancing it. Because um, some roads, like, like University Parkway, have a lot of through traffic. You'll notice before they did all the construction that um, they would really try to restrict the number of driveways on it. They had the raised median. Um, where um, a road that is like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, I was going to use Provo Center Street, but even there they've kind of, they don't have a lot of driveways. Um, I, I, I guess I don't quite understand your question, but, but every road should have access management looked at. So there, it's not like any road is exempt. Actually, some of, the, one, some of the case studies were in Tennessee. They have these rural highways that look like Bulldog Boulevard, kind of, where you have two or three lanes in each way and a two-way turn lane, but it'll go for dozens of miles. It just will go on and on and on, just one long, you're out in the country, but there's just strip development, kind of out near uh, Dollywood and uh, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And it's just it, really poor access management, but it just goes on and on and on and on. And so I think a lot of those corridors, they're wanting to get in and try to figure out, okay, yeah, all this through traffic, but yet there's driveways everywhere. So did they ever consider a roundabout in Newtown? Um, she did. Around the flagpole, flagpole and then people that would make sense. Yeah, did she she did not a, mention that. Mini roundabout. Yeah. Well, I was thinking at a minimum they had to put, at least put a flower box or something, you know, yeah, just to like make it really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, she she didn't mention. That pole's going down, you know. Uh, I mean, wonder if it's a breakaway. Maybe it's yeah. A breakaway. <laughs> well, light pole's a breakaway. It looks like a pretty big base, though. <laughs> Yeah, she did. She mentioned earlier in her presentation that they had a problem with. Um, they went in to do some presentation, and Connecticut DOT had not. There, there's, there, there's was a philosophy engineers had of design, defend, and build. And so the idea is, you just go ahead and design it. This is going to be what's right. Then you go to the public meetings. You do the bare minimum public meetings, and if people have a problem, you just duke it out with them. And if they take you to court, you beat them in court, and you build it. And so the Connecticut DOT did that, and the whole time they were designing it, they really had very little community input with this corridor, and this neighborhood just got angrier and angrier and angrier, and DOT was just like, well, I'm sure it'll be fine. It'll blow over. So by the time they had the public meeting, she said they all went in there, and uh, everybody's acting kind of civil. And then finally, when it's kind of the Q&A part, one guy got up and says, I have a problem with this. You guys never talked to us at all about it. And if you talked to us, you would have known you can't do this, this, and this. And the person sitting next to him, yeah! And the party soon, like half the crowd turned on them, and the off-duty uh, policeman who was working security had to escort them out for their own safety. And she said the project never got built. They just never could recover from the... Uh, and so, so if you're ever in a situation where you're, you're working with a DOT or whatever and, and they want to do design, design, defend, build, it sounds like that can be problematic. Sometimes it's better to just get people in on the process earlier on. But anyway. Yeah? So I'm trying to just make sure I understood you right. Basically, it's the TRB that has all of these presentations mm -hmm. on the website. And it's like whenever there's a conference or something, people present, they record it, <coughs> ish kind of a thing. Is that what it is? And then basically nobody ever goes and looks at those. And even if they do, they're really dry. And so this well, idea of trying to it's it's not it's not so much that the presentation's dry. The presentations are actually pretty good. Oh, yeah. The problem is it's difficult to find even on the TRB Access Management website. Oh, wow. um, that could be fixed, but on top of it, it's difficult because Google can only crawl what text data you put there. And you can't type out a transcript of the entire presentation. I mean, I guess in theory, if that could be done on a man, I mean, but um, so the idea is, okay, well, let's pull out the real nuggets, the stuff that's like, yeah, I mean, like if, if, I, if I were to clip the Newtown flagpole, I'd, I'd pull that out. Like that's, that's a, I think, a pretty cool story. 
and then you put that on YouTube, then, okay, TRB people who are really motivated to find it, yeah, they may still find it the old way. But a lot of these people work for DOTs, cities and counties, consulting firms. They may just happen to be typing stuff into Google. Google finds the YouTube video, and then they go, oh, wow, I didn't even know the site was here. So it's kind of a, not just an outreach thing, it's a, almost like a soft marketing. An access thing. Access to access yeah. management. Yeah. I'd, be, I'd actually be careful the way I phrased that in my project report. I wasn't saying that. So and then you had it, yeah. Yeah, so I know UDOT has their own um, spacing requirements for a signal and like the first writing right now after a freeway and the last writing right, right, right out before a freeway interchange. Uh, did you compare those numbers with um, the numbers you saw in the case studies that deal with that? I did not. I just I think I just assumed that because it was looking at other states too, and okay. uh, having access management policies that have, and those are all relatively recent, just in the last yeah. two decades. But I think the assumption I kind of made and was kind of looking at this is when new stuff gets built, places that have access management policies, I think. It looks like they tend to try to follow them as much as they can. But because most of the stuff that gets built isn't new, it's retrofit, that's the bigger question is, what do you do when you have a retrofit? You can ask for too much. You know, there was in one case study I looked at in Oregon where they had everything, all their ducks in a row, they had some agreements with the city, it was okay, they weren't going to meet anywhere close. Oregon has some of the strictest spacing guidelines on new stuff. And ODOT and the city had kind of come to an agreement of what they were going to do. And then, because they were getting close to billing, ODOT suddenly put their foot down and said, no, we want everything. And the agreement totally fell apart, and they ended up rebuilding the interchange with no improvement. Yeah? It seems when you move, like there was that one case study where they just moved where the interchange was. I'm sure that was incredibly expensive to do that. But also, I'm just wondering, do, I feel like, Especially businesses, <coughs> businesses like really, really fight access management because these examples, you know, of one, m most of the businesses right next to an interchange are there because they're right next to an interchange, and two, they all want their seven driveways so people can get through their site and whatever. And so, in the case studies that you were looking at, how often did perhaps like the state transportation agency? come to a consensus with the business owners to actually do something that was productive? Uh, quite a bit. Um, the, the good news is the NCHRP synthesis and case studies tend to show that actually if you improve the access management, sales goes up. And that subconsciously I think, and this is where I'm just putting on my armchair psychologist hat, that we get stressed out. I mean, I think subconsciously there have been times where I would have gone down to eat on Bulldog and just the stress of all that conflict, I go, nah, I'll just go to Burger Supreme or something. I just, you know. Um, but um, there was one case study where they had um, in Alabama, as you come off the freeway, there were seven driveways in a row, like fast food, fast food, fast food, fast food. And a big Bass Pro Shop went in behind it. And so in the process of Bass Pro Shop doing its traffic study, all the access was looked at. And that was the service road on the bullet point I mentioned, is they sat down and worked with those seven places and said, hey, we'll work with you, but let's put in a private frontage road that kind of ties all your businesses together in the front. And then they were able to take those seven driveways down to two and a half because you had two full accesses and then one where you just kind of went right, right out and in, into it. And so I think that's the key, and that's where I brought up the, the Newtown flagpole, the public coordination is, in every case, you're going to be working with private and trying to help them realize that their sales are reducing, the, like that shell, that, that mobile station that had four driveways or whatever it was, their sales aren't really going to drop off if suddenly they're down to one or two. You know? um, four isn't necessarily an, an improvement. And so it's education, bringing them in early rather than just force feeding them the, the improvement. And, and, as t and, and then the other is looking at examples in the community. If you can get one access management project in, and that was the Cooper Street in Arlington, they at first were trying to give examples of, well, in Denver we did this, and people say, yeah, but we're Texas, we're different. Yeah. So then they had to find another example somewhere in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and say, oh, but on this street, look how well it turned out. 
and then they go, oh, okay, if it turned out well there, then the Cooper Street goes in, and then the next project can say, hey, look at how well Cooper Street turned in, and eventually you kind of get the ball rolling. So. Okay, thank you.